In any emergency department, ankle injuries are a common presentation. Oh. Ouch, that must have hurt. Tyler the skateboarder could have one of two things. One, a ligamentous injury, or two, a fracture of the ankle or foot. In order to diagnose a fracture, you need to be able to interpret an x-ray. In this tutorial, we will discuss an approach to x-rays of the ankle and foot and how to recognize the common fractures thereof. Firstly, assess quality of the x-ray. The most important part of being able to correctly diagnose a foot and ankle fracture is being able to interpret the x-ray. Like all x-rays, you must first consider the quality of the x-ray. This includes, one, checking that this is the correct patient, checking the date that it was taken, asking what type of projection it is, making sure that the appropriate anatomy is included, looking if it is under or over penetrated, checking for rotation, and lastly, if there's any artifact that should not be there. On an AP ankle x-ray, you want to ensure that both the tibia and fibula are visible up to the metatarsals. Make sure that you can see the bony trabeculae and soft tissue margins. To exclude rotation, look at the medial and lateral joints. They should normally be open. On medial lateral ankle x-ray, check the penetration by looking for both telodermes as, well as, as well as how the fibula and tibula are superimposed. On any foot x-ray, ensure that you can see from the calcaneus slash talus all the way through to the phalanges. On DP view, there's an open joint space between the medial and intermediate cuneiforms. This is obliterated on oblique view, which is taken at an angle of 40 degrees. On lateral view, ensure that the calcaneus and fifth metatarsals are seen in profile. Pathology. Firstly, trace all the bony outlines in an x-ray looking for any break in continuity. Check to see that the bones are aligned correctly and look for any particular areas of lucency or sclerosis that could indicate pathology. Review areas include checking the position of the talus, the tibiofibular syndesmosis, rollers angle, and the Liz Frank ligament. Lastly, look if there's any soft tissue compartment to the injury. But wait, do all ankles need x-rays? Studies have shown that about 15% of those presenting with an ankle injury have a fracture. Not everyone needs an x-ray. The decision about whether an x-ray is needed can be based on the TALA rules. Palpate along the posterior edge and tips of the medial and lateral malleoli, as well as the base of the fifth metatarsal, and the immediately located navicular bone. If there's tenderness over these regions, there will be a fracture and an ankle or foot x-ray is indicated. If the patient is unable to take four steps at the time of injury as well as at the time of examination, x-ray should be taken. These rules have been found to have to close to 100% sensitivity in adults and in children over six, and if applied, decreases unnecessary radiation exposure, costs, and time spent in the emergency department. Ankle fractures. These are mostly low-energy fractures involving one or both malleoli. It's seen in young active individuals or sports players, as well as post-menopausal women who are at an increased risk of osteoporosis. Mechanism of injury involves the patient stumbling and falling. The foot is anchored onto the ground while the body thrusts forward. This causes the ankle to twist and the talus to tilt or rotate forcibly, causing a low energy fracture one or both malleoli. Proper reduction of this is necessary. Salter Harris fractures are fractures through a growth plate. Therefore, they are unique to pediatric patients. Salter Harris fractures commonly occur in the ankle. These fractures are categorized according to the involvement of the physis, metaphysis, and epiphysis. The classification of injury is important because it affects the patient's treatment and provides clues to possible long term complications. Ankle fractures are classified according to the Weber ankle fracture classification. Type A A transverse fracture through the fibula below the tibia fibula syndesmosis. This may be associated with an oblique or vertical fracture of the medial malleolus. Type B. There's an oblique or spiral fracture of the fibula at the level of the syndesmosis. Often, there's also an avulsion injury on the medial side. Type C. Above the level of the syndesmosis. This is more severe as these fractures are more unstable. Plafond fractures or pilon fractures. The mechanism of injury involves a large force that drives the talus upwards against the tibial plafond. There's an accompanying damage to the articulate cartilage. In severe cases, the comminution extends up the tibial shaft. Prompt reduction of this is necessary. On x-ray, fractures of the distal end of the tibula 
extending up into the ankle joint and possibly up the tibial shaft can be seen. Its treatment requires a high level of expertise as the surgery involved is quite complex. The talus is a tarsal bone in the hind foot that articulates with the tibia, fibula, calcaneus and navicular bones. It has no muscular attachments and around 60% of its surface is covered by articular cartilage. Fun fact, the superior articular surface carries a greater load per unit area than any bone in the body. It has a vulnerable blood supply and has a relatively common site for post-traumatic ischemic necrosis. Many talar fractures are subtle and easily missed. However, they can lead to long-term disability when there is a disruption of the subtalar or telenavicular joints. This x-ray shows a fracture of the talar neck on lateral radiograph. This is a talar body fracture on anterior posterior radiograph. Posterior process fracture on lateral radiograph and lateral process fracture on anterior posterior radiograph. Calcaneal fractures. This is the most commonly fractured tarsal bone. They are often accompanied by disability. Take a moment to review the anatomy of the calcaneus, mechanism of injury. The patient usually falls from a height onto one or both heels. On impact, the calcaneus is rammed up against the talus and is split or crushed. This may be accompanied by other injuries, including the spine, pelvis, and hip. Avulsion fractures may also occur. Calcaneal fractures are categorized as either extraarticular or intraarticular fractures. Extraarticular fractures do not involve the subtalar or calcaneal cuboid joints. Intraarticular fractures involve the subtalar or calcaneal cuboid joints. On x ray, one must assess the borough's angle. This is the angle formed between a line drawn from the calcaneal tuberosity to the posterior articular surface and another line drawn from the posterior articular surface to the anterior articular surface, as illustrated in the, in the diagram. Bowler's angle is normally from 20 to 40 degrees. If the angle is less than 20 degrees, it's indicative of a calcaneal fractures. Fractures of the calcaneus itself can be seen on the x-ray as well. Upward displacement of the body of the calcaneus produces a sign of a depressed fracture as indicated on the x-rays. Common foot fractures. Liz Frank fractures. These are rare but important not to miss. About 20 to 30 percent of these injuries are initially missed. Mechanism of injury. This involves a twisting and crushing injury. This causes the foot to bend or twist at the midfoot forefoot junction. It should be suspected in patients with pain and swelling of the foot following a high velocity car accident or fall. X-rays. Assess the second and fourth metatarsals. The following indicate a Liz Frank fracture. Widening of the space between the, the first and second metatarsal bones. The medial edge of the second metatarsal should be in line with the medial edge of the intermediate cuneiform bone. Metatarsal fractures. These may be crushed injuries, spiral fractures due to twisting injuries and stress fractures. Some fractures will be obvious or can be identified simply by inspecting the outlines of each metatarsal. Stress fractures. Stress fractures, especially of the second metatarsal, are common and occur in young adults who are on their feet a lot, like military recruits or an elderly woman with osteoporosis. The foot becomes painful and slightly swollen from overuse. On examination, there will be a tender lump just distal to the mid shaft of a metatarsal. The x-ray is often initially normal, a hairline crack may become visible later, and after four to six weeks, a bony callus develops. In the elderly, there is sometimes only a fine linear periosteal reaction indicating the fracture. Other metatarsal fractures are avulsion fractures and Jones fractures, both of which are specific to the fifth metatarsal. Jones fracture. At the junction between the diaphysis and metaphysis in the fifth metatarsal, there is a watershed area. Fractures occurring at this junction are termed Jones fractures. Due to the relatively poor blood supply, they are particularly difficult to treat and have a higher rate of non-union. Thus, when assessing a fracture of the fifth metatarsal, take account of the position of the fracture, whether it's in the mid-shaft, characteristic of a stress fracture, or the metaphysis, junction, as in Jones fracture, or the proximal tuberosity, as in an avulsion fracture. Phalangeal fractures. Fractures of the phalanges can be markedly painful, and the mechanism of injury is typically a heavy object falling on the toes. An example would be forced abduction of a stub toe against an obstacle, appropriately termed a night walker fracture. 
These x-rays show on the right an angulated salta Harris II fracture of the fifth proximal phalanx and x-ray on the left a dorsally displaced transverse fracture of the neck of the third proximal phalanx. Sesamoid fractures. Fractures of the sesamoids are generally uncommon. The mechanism of injury is either direct injury, for example, landing from a height onto the ball of the foot, or sudden traction, for example, chronic repetitive stress seen in dancers or runners. This patient had a history of a road traffic accident and fractures are seen in the shaft of the second, third, and fourth metatarsal bones with a transverse fracture of the sesamoid bone adjacent to the first metatarsal. Collagen fractures and fractures associated with ligamentous injury. The common twisted ankle, which results from imbalanced load on an inverted and plantar flex foot, may be associated with an avalgic fracture of the fifth metatarsal base or an avalgic fracture of the malleolar tip. An avalgic fracture of the fifth metatarsal also occurs with pole by perianus brevis. Injury to the lateral ligaments of the foot due to twisting injuries of the foot occur frequently. They are associated with avalgic fractures of the lateral malleolar tip or sometimes avalgic fractures of the anterior lateral surface of the talus. X-rays should include AP, lateral, and Maltese views. Strain on side-to-side -side movements can cause dislocation of the perineal tendon. Patients often hear a snap when the injury occurs. Perineal tendon dislocations are associated with avulsion fractures of the retinaculum. A tiny bone fragment is seen lateral to the lateral malleolus on x-ray. Avulsion fractures of the calcaneal tuberosity results from pulling of the Achilles tendon. This can occur in forced dorsiflexion of the foot during a fall as gastrocnemius and sedius muscles contract. Inferior tibiofibular ligament tears may occur with malleolar fractures and are a result of twisting injuries. X-rays may show separation of the tibiofibular joint and fractures of the distal tibia fibula. Aversion or pronation injuries of the foot can cause deltoid ligament tears, which are associated with fractures of the distal fibula. X-rays reveal widened medial joint space and a separated tibiofibular joint. That concludes our approach to ankle and foot injuries. Thank you for watching.